Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Steph, and I'm a technical writer at a company called Splunk. Today, I'm going to talk about how to define and document top API use cases. So uh, this is me on top of Mount Sai, which is just outside of Seattle. You can see Rainier off to the right and the woods I've just walked through, which seemed like a good choice of picture given the theme of my talk, uh, talking about creating paths through the woods. So I've been working at Splunk for the past three and a half years. For most of that time, my role has been to be the steward of the REST API documentation for our product Splunk Enterprise. This product has over 700 publicly documented and not auto-generated endpoints. And I'm responsible for keeping them up to date, improving them over time, and fielding any customer questions about the docs. Of course, I have help from our wonderful team of writers and editors. So I've been able to make significant changes and improvements to the documentation over time. So that's what I wanna talk about today. How I've made our sprawling REST API reference documentation more useful and more accessible to our users. I'm gonna talk about that through a creative writing analogy that I picked up from Philip Pullman, author of The Golden Compass and other fantasy stories primarily targeted at young adults. He's also written a book on writing as many successful authors have. And I found it useful as a hobbyist creative writer, but also in my professional life as a technical writer. I find there's a lot of crossover skills between the two types of writing. I like the young adult genre in particular because I think it has more in common with technical writing than other forms of creative writing. The sentences tend to be short, the words tend to be small and possible, and the genre favors simple concepts. The stories tend to sort of bash you over the head with their themes and lessons rather than leaving a lot up to the reader's interpretation. In general, it's less subtle than creative writing meant for adults. And I don't think it's controversial to say that subtleties are better avoided in technical communication. So as I said before, like many authors, Holman's written a book on writing. Um, he conceptualizes his storytelling process as a trail through a dense wood. The wood is the fantasy world. Much is going on out there, but the reader can't possibly see all of it. Any more than any one of us knows everything happening in the real world at any given time. I suppose that's why uh, Tolkien wrote Cimmerillion and why we have 24-hour news channels, but most fantasy authors don't include actual reference documentation for their stories or their universe. Instead, in most fantasy books, we simply see from the perspective of a few characters as they uh, chart their path or paths through the world. In a tightly written, engaging narrative, we don't go traipsing off on our own through the world. We're guided along a carefully marked golden trail. Um, so in my analogy, the trail is your procedural and conceptual documentation, like tutorials or guides. If your paths are placed carefully, then it's a rare reader who has to go dig out the Cimmerillion or your reference documentation for a crucial detail. Most readers can follow the same few paths and arrive quickly and safely where they intended to go. That is to say they can accomplish their goals with your software. I'll extend this analogy through my entire talk, so prepare yourself now. First, I'll discuss how to figure out what paths are missing. And then we'll talk about what the paths actually represent, that is to say different kinds of technical documentation that help readers figure out which endpoints will be most useful to them, as well as how to use them. Finally, I'll talk about how to place and network the paths you've created. So the obvious first question is, how do I pick the paths? So in the past few years that I've spent working on this problem, I've found four good methods or heuristics for picking paths that readers will want to follow. Uh, the first one is analytics, or usage data for your documentation. Um, you can get this through Google Analytics, obviously, but I'm going to talk a bit about something I use called Splunk Zero and uh, other, any other tool that shows uh, usage statistics for your documentation. Also, of course, is direct customer feedback, um, whether that's through a simple conversation or through email or through sites like Stack Overflow. Uh, all of that's very useful. I've also interacted with support and sales based on frequency of support calls on a topic, 
or common questions that sales engineers encounter. You might not have access to all of these avenues of information, but even using one or two of them can help you improve your dogs. All of these different avenues have two things in common. First, they let you iterate. You can use these sources and then make changes to your docs and then later see what new feedback comes from the pipeline. If you look at feedback before and after making a change, you can often catch things that would have been easy to miss otherwise. If a constant barrage of flustered comments about a certain topic suddenly stops when you add a new tutorial on that topic, that's obviously a success. In this case, no news is definitely good news. And you might have missed that if you hadn't been monitoring those channels of information before you made the change. It's uh, easy to miss an absence of something. Um, second, all of these sources look at where readers are walking. <laughs> and then they create the paths along those lines. If you don't go in that order, if you create the path and then you see if it gets followed, you might find readers are more inclined to take shortcuts and avoid using your paths or your docs entirely. No one wants to get the same sad, repeated comments from tons of users about how they can't figure out how to use your APIs to, for example, manipulate knowledge objects. This doesn't feel good after you invested a ton of time writing a tutorial for something else that you find later never got any hits. So I'm gonna dive deeply into each of these channels of information and talk about how to use them and what to look for. So analytics, the first obvious tool here is Google Analytics. And while I've definitely used that to get information about how users are traveling through my docs, I expect many or most of you have also used that or at least heard of it. So I'd really like to share something new with you today. Um, so I'm not going to focus on that tool. I'm fortunate to have another source of information available to me, something called Splunk Zero. It's nice to work at a big data company. Um, <laughs> So uh, Splunk Zero lets me Splunk Splunk. Um, it's Splunk the verb followed by Splunk the company. Um, so to translate that, Splunk Zero lets me use the data processing functions of Splunk on Splunk's own docs. A lot of Splunking. We use Splunk Zero to find out things like how many customers have used a page, how many comments a page has received over time, or what method customers have used to access a page, like a web browser or PDF download. An intern that I worked with last summer named Sonnet, she used it to figure out how often readers use control F to look for terms that were hidden behind a collapsed section. Very specific in that way. It's super powerful and useful tool um, for all of us, I think, on the doc team. So uh, let's look at an example. Uh, this example is pretty basic. Um, I was using it to find out information about how users are accessing our docs or how frequently. Um, so I'll quickly translate the search bar near the top of the screenshot. I'm basically, I'm telling Splunk Zero which subsection of our docs that I want to focus on. Uh, in this case, that's the reference documentation for the Splunk Enterprise, Splunk Enterprise REST APIs. Then I'm telling it what information to place onto the chart below. I've also narrowed the search to just the past week. The ability to select a time range can let me see how things have changed before and after a certain point. For example, my, I may have added a new tutorial a week ago, and I want to see if anybody's found it yet. Uh, in the chart on the bottom half of the screen, you can see the titles of individual pages listed in the third column under the heading Manual Topic. I've ordered by the fourth column, which is called Total Views. The most frequently accessed page is the landing page, of course, that's not surprising. Um, and after that, I can see which pages are runners up for most frequently accessed. If I see a jump after I add information to one of these pages, it seems like a positive sign that users are at least finding the docs I added. I've also used this to test out certain linking schemes and see where different linking schemes uh, tend to funnel readers. And in this way, analytics can be like a map, letting you see the paths readers are currently taking through your docs. Um, maybe even a bit like the Marauders map in Harry Potter where you can like, see the users moving around with little names over their heads. It'd be really nice to have one of those, but you might not be able to spunk your docs. Though, depending on what data you collect, uh, you might be able to. Um, if you have a way to see data about how your docs are used, regardless of what that way is, 
I highly encourage you to look at it frequently and see what your readers are up to. Uh, of course, analytics doesn't actually tell you what readers think of the docs once they find them. For that, uh, one has to interact with customers in some way. Personally, uh, I find analytics interesting, but hearing directly from customers what they think of my documentation and ideally how it's improved the part of their lives that they spend using the product, it's one of my favorite parts of the job. I uh, don't find a lot of things more rewarding than seeing my work help someone. So that brings us to the next mechanism that I'm fortunate to have access to, which is direct customer feedback on my docs through a comment mechanism. Some of our users really love this feature <laughs> and they use it extensively. Um, I've gotten to know some of our users very well through email threads as they pick apart what I've written. Um, some seem really genuinely thrilled to help me make our docs better. Some are less than thrilled at first, but often once they realize there's a real person behind the comment box, they tend to become nicer and frame their comments in a more productive light. Many of the comments that I receive come from customers who found undocumented nooks and crannies in our REST APIs or simply typos or small oversights. These comments are definitely useful, but they're not necessarily relevant to our mission today of figuring out where to place extra guidance around our reference docs. Fairly often though, I, I found some trends in the rest of the comments that are very helpful with that question. An example I mentioned earlier involved manipulating knowledge objects with the REST API. In the interest of avoiding giving a class on Splunk today, um, let's just say that Splunk includes a lot of different types of knowledge objects and users can manipulate or use them through the Splunk UI, but they can also access them in various ways programmatically through a series of endpoints. Each type of object is quite different in how it can be accessed though, through the API though. And the best way to access each type of object is not necessarily intuitive. So users were pretty happy to point that out to me repeatedly <laughs> using our comment system and other methods of direct feedback like the Splunk subreddit. Or um, see, I have a publicly posted uh, Splunk Answers post. So Splunk Answers is basically Stack Overflow in its format. Um, folks post questions, other folks try to answer them, and you can upload or download as you see fit. Uh, so this example is just one of many similar comments I got on the documentation for types of knowledge objects in Splunk. Here a macro is a type of knowledge object. So this person has pieced together an understanding of how to use the endpoints that we've documented to complete his task, but uh, he's missing some details. This particular type of knowledge object requires a particular method and that information, it's in the reference manual, but it's buried a bit deep. So this user had to leave the path and blaze his own trail through the woods. His adventure turned off some of the information he needed, but not all. Fortunately, I was able to point him in the right direction, but giving one lost traveler directions is pretty inefficient when many are becoming lost by the same method. It became pretty clear to me at this point that I needed to create a path in the documentation that was easy to find, that users could follow to complete this high frequency task. There's no need for dozens or more of users to be blazing their own trails by their lonesome, when as a writer, you can make one for everybody. So I set aside some time and I wrote a guide for how to access each type of knowledge object through the APIs. This is just part of the guide. Uh, it included a chart and a few examples and linked out to relevant reference information. I'll talk in more detail about how I create this type of documentation later in the presentation. But for now, I'll just say I'm happy to report that the comments stopped. In the past year, I've only gotten one comment from a user who didn't find the tutorial. And I was able to change my leaking structure and make it a bit better based on that comment. This drastic reduction in lost users was a significant enough improvement to be pretty clear without analytics, but check the analytics anyway, because it's kind of fun to have data. So, um, it's possible that you don't have access at your organization to the analytics type data about your docs, or like maybe your docs aren't online, for example, or it's possible that you don't get the opportunity to engage directly with customers all that often. But if your organization offers support to users, then you have a source there you can use to look for opportunities to better guide your readers. Support engineers and others who regularly talk to customers are a fantastic source of indirect customer feedback. For example, 
Um, I began a project once because a customer with a large support contract reached out for support, reached out to support for help with a particular procedure. Unfortunately, I can't be too specific in this example. I can say, though, that while in some cases, customers really have a niche set up and the support they receive is so personalized that it doesn't make much sense to document it. Um, just no one's going to run into the same problem. But here, that was definitely not true. In this case, the engineer who fielded their call thought that it was probably something others would want to do too. And the customer also mentioned they would like to have a written procedure to reference later, so they wouldn't have to keep calling every time they wanted to do this. Uh, that's the point where I got looped into the project. So after we helped that particular customer, I worked to generalize the procedure and added it to our documentation. I was able to see shortly after on Splunk Zero that the page was getting hit, and I even got a few comments on that page later. Um, so the comments did ask questions that helped me refine the page, but they also confirmed that the page was useful. So since then, I'm a firm believer that if you aren't in contact with support of your organization, you're neglecting a potentially excellent source of information. Uh, lost readers often end up knocking on support stores. <laughs> I suppose in this analogy that makes support kind of like Tom Bombadil. Um, regardless, they can definitely help you figure out where you have missing paths. So on a similar note, sales team members, especially in my experience, sales engineers, can be a great source of similar information. Um, again, I can't be as specific in my example here as with a publicly posted comment, but to generalize, I've really received two kinds of help from sales over the past few years. First, in my experience, sales sees documentation with fresh eyes. I've had one particular sales engineer ask me questions about my docs that made me realize I was making significant assumptions about the reader's knowledge. It's a bit like having a signpost without a trail. So the reader knows they need to go in a certain general direction, but how? Second, sometimes sales representatives receive specific feature requests or questions about the product's capabilities. Sometimes the request isn't something that exists in the product. And as a technical writer, that's mostly out of my scope. But sometimes the capability is there if you know which um, endpoints to call or where to look. So this often points to a place where a new path might be useful. Later in this presentation, I'll show an example of a chart I created to answer a customer question that a sales engineer passed along to me. I really appreciate this type of opportunity. Um, because in this particular case, uh, after I responded to the request for a chart, the sales engineer presented my chart directly to the client who was able to give immediate feedback on how the chart helped them figure out if they could use Splunk to solve their problem. It was a really satisfying collaboration. So we've now spent a lot of time talking about how to figure out where the missing path should go and what customers are trying to do that they can do, but they can't figure out how to do. So the next question is, what do these paths look like? If you're a hiker, you know that not all trails are created equally. Um, some press you in tight with thorny bushes on both sides, and some are sort of meandering scenic routes, which are maybe better suited for weekend backpacking than for enterprise software users. So we want the equivalent of well-marked, direct, wide paths. We want readers to be able to quickly identify which path is best for them and we want it to move them efficiently to where they need to go. In my experience, I've found that folks who use our REST APIs tend to respond best to these types of documentation strategies. So tutorials and use cases are quite specialized, and uh, I think they generally help a smaller but still significant number of users um, compared to the other types listed here. But if your reader finds these docs to be a great fit, they'll be really enthusiastic about them. Charts and disambiguation and uh, linking, they're a bit more generally applicable. And in my experience, they're seen by more users. They don't provide quite as much in-depth help though. They exist more to direct and like funnel users rather than to be a destination. So now I'll dive in more deep into how I create these types of paths. So to me, what distinguishes a tutorial or use case from other types of docs is actually following an example. 
rather than uh, being a general procedure. So in this subsection, we're following the adventures of Alice specifically and her safe search, which is creatively named My Search. I think this narrative style helps readers recognize their own case in the example. Yeah, I think it lets readers uh, follow along with the tutorial better and then they can do all the steps themselves and see at the end that they got the same result. Um, or if they didn't get the same result, they can see where they went astray and backtrack. Uh, I like to use these when I see reader after reader trying to accomplish the same goal with our APIs. These may be very specific, but if many reader, readers have the same specific problem, um, a direct pathway to that specific solution is definitely called for. I don't typically use these types of tutorials when I see readers struggling to understand a concept, or I see a cluster of use cases that are related, but with key differences. I think those situations are better suited to charts or disambiguation style pages. So this is an example of a chart that I created um, that also serves as a disambiguation page. Actually, I mentioned this solution earlier when I was talking about using sales engineers as a resource for discovering an uncharted area of your reference documentation. The customer in this case wanted to understand the support level of these areas that they would have if they went with our Splunk Cloud product and how they would be limited. In this chart, they can quickly see broad outlines of what clusters of endpoints are available and what are, which ones are not available and which ones have partial support. So. Uh, this chart gives not just a general idea of what capabilities are available, but it also shows the reader where in the reference documentation they should go if they do want to see more details. It's a bit like a Wikipedia disambiguation page um, in that it acts as a splitter. So it divides off a larger pool of users into smaller groups, and it funnels those groups to the appropriate location in the docs. In this way, the page can serve two types of users, um, generalists trying to make a quick decision, and specialists who want to dig into a specific endpoint or a group of endpoints. Without the start, users would have to go bouncing around the reference documentation as a whole, which in this case is uh, all 700 or so endpoints, to see which ones are relevant to Splunk Cloud and which ones their access is limited. And that would be on a case-by-case -case basis, which is obviously not ideal. Um, in this way, the chart sort of pulls users out of the woods and directs them onto a path. So finally, let's uh, talk briefly about links in general and their function as paths. This is, I think, where the analogy is most intuitive. We're all really used to thinking of links as creating a network or a web, um, much like forest trails. Sometimes I use links to draw readers directly out of the woods of the reference docs. Say uh, your users are constantly asking questions about a certain endpoint. And so you create a tutorial about the most common use case you see for that endpoint. Great. Um, so then putting a link to the relevant tutorial on that endpoint docs just makes sense. Uh, it brings the relevant users onto your path from their most common point of contact with your docs, kind of like a trailhead. Conversely, as we all know, linking to the reference docs from a tutorial prevents you from having to commit the sin of duplicating content. Um, sometimes the reader really does need to go off into the woods alone, but your link can serve as a starting point. So uh, a final word of caution from my personal experience. Um, it's important to remember that users have their own relationship to links. Uh, before totally restructuring your linking system between your API reference docs and your conceptual documentation, it's important to keep in mind that users often have bookmarks or are used to finding certain material at a certain place. Users that were not lost before can become lost if you move information without leaving signposts. So I hope that this presentation helped you better conceptualize why and how we create documentation around our reference API documentation. My approach focuses on identifying top use cases because I think there's no point creating documentation that doesn't get used. Um, you can probably think of sources of information about top use cases at your organization that aren't just analytics, feedback, support, and sales. The key part is putting the customer's needs first and every organization interfaces with users a bit differently. Thank you for listening to my ideas. I hope they serve as a springboard for your own.